And good afternoon, folks. Welcome to another edition of Futsal 868 Corner Talks. My name is Geoff Edwards, series moderator and president of the Futsal Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Futsal 868 Corner Talks is an online meetup series where global sporting professionals share their experiences and perspectives on the fastest growing indoor sport in the world, Futsal. This month, April, Futsal 868 hosts Futsal in CONCACAF. This four-part series aims to sensitize and educate all to the sport of futsal in the Confederation. Our guests will assist to provide an in-depth look at the game of futsal in their countries and regions of the Caribbean, Latin, and North America. Today, in episode 14, we continue with part three of the series. Our guest is Mr. Keith Tozer, Commissioner at Professional Futsal League United States of America. We want to say good day to Mr. Tuzo. How are you doing, Keith? Uh, I'm doing great, Jeffrey, and it's great to be back in the show. Wow, opening music. You're, you're doing it all, man. 50 shows. Wow, congratulations. Yeah. We, we are too short of 50, but at the same point in time, we want to say thank you very much for being here. Um, but you also have been an inspiration because I think I was in the, in the top the first 10 of your episodes when, it, when your podcast started. And here it is, based on our conversation before the Saturday show, you're close to a quarter of a million. That is impressive. And it showed, clearly shows what's happening with futsal globally. But let's just give a, a, a recap as regards to, for those who don't know who is Keith Tozer, I call him Mr. Futsal USA. Um, Connie may not like that, but it is what it is. <laughs> Give us, tell us for our audience, who is Keith Tozer? Well, if we're just talking about the futsal world, uh, I played and coached in the major indoor soccer league for pretty much 30 to 35 years. And what happened in 1986, my coach in the professional league uh, asked me if I wanted to try out for the national team. And at, I think at that time, Jeffrey, we were calling it five-a-side. So the first FIFA tournament was in uh, Budapest, Hungary. Um, went to Budapest, uh, became captain of the team, loved the game right away, just fell in love with it. Um, and then years later, um, I became an interim coach uh, underneath the same coach, John Kowalski, then became the head coach. And one thing led to another, and futsal's been great, and I really love it. You break down two to three decades so simply, Keith. But then there's Keith, the coach. Keith, the administrator, yeah. Keith, the coaching specialist, and Keith, the podcaster. This is outside of you being a husband and a father. Tell us as regards to Keith, the podcaster, the administrator, the coach, both national and club level in the United States of America, and also the administrator, commissioner of the Professional Futsal League in the United States of America. All yours. Well, first and foremost, I have four children. My youngest is 10. My oldest is 33. Um, and I'm just very proud to be a father. And they're wonderful children. Um, actually, my oldest one's going to get married very soon. Uh, as far as um, coaching, um, I, I, I always said that I'm a teacher before I manage a game or coach a game. And, I, and that's where my true passion comes from. I feel that if I was a teacher in a school, I'd rather take an F and D student and try to get them to be a B or an A student than take an A student and just kind of maintaining them. I, I really love uh, helping young people become better uh, in the game of futsal. Um, the administrator, uh, you know, I, I was the head coach of the national team for 20 years. Uh, this is actually going to be the first CONCACAF championship that I'm not involved in since 1996, but it was an extreme honor to coach the U U.S. for as long as we did. Uh, we were fortunate enough to win two gold medals, two bronze, uh, and, and go to two or three world championships. Uh, but it was so great to look for players, to teach players, help coaches. And that kind of experience uh, led me into becoming the technical director of the United States Youth Futsal, as well as the commissioner of the Professional Futsal League. So it's, it's been a great journey. Got a lot of things more to do and uh, uh, a lot of things more to learn about it. Again, this gentleman, guys, is being ex extremely humble because when did you do a Google search as regards to Keith Tozer, he has the most wins 
in US indoor soccer. Um, so thanks for humility, Keith. <laughs> I really appreciate that. I appreciate and well, as you I guys see, I didn't have those wins. It, it was a team thing because I never won one game on my own. So true, uh, true. Yeah, I love indoor soccer. Um, you know, Jeffrey. Years ago, we always had good teams during the regular season, but we couldn't get well into the playoffs or win a championship. When I became head coach of the national team, it gave me the ability to travel the world in futsal and learn from coaches from Brazil and Spain and Italy and Russia. So for me to travel the world was like a learning experience for me. So what I would do is when I came back from a national team trip, I took that methodology to learn and put it in indoor soccer and we kind of make, made kind of like a hybrid system and diagonal running and rotations and how to split walls. And people were like, where is all this stuff coming from? That's when we started winning championships because I started as a head coach of the national team in 1996. We won the gold medal. We won our first indoor championship in 1998, and then we won five more championships. But futsal really helped me as a coach uh, in the indoor game. So, for those who are watching on, a quick one. What's the difference to you, as you, or I should say, similarities and differences to you as regards to futsal and indoor soccer, as some people know it, even here in the Caribbean, as well as do you see an a, opportunity for indoor soccer to transcend to futsal um, in the United States of America because it's still somewhat popular, so to speak? Back in the late 70s and early 80s, actually, indoor soccer uh, was somewhat as big as the NBA. And you had NBA owners, you had NHL owners, you had NFL owners that were involved in indoor soccer. And at that time, Jeffrey, Major League Soccer wasn't playing. So the best American players played indoor soccer. Um, then we took those players and we made them futsal players. And then we were one of the best teams in the world because at that time, futsal was just starting to become a professional sport, starting national teams and FIFA uh, World Cups so we could, we could compete. Um, so indoor soccer has been really important to the futsal um, success. And I think the professional futsal league, once we get running, obviously is going to be a huge uh, development for our U.S. national team. So I, I think indoor soccer has got its place in America. And I think futsal is definitely going to have its place in America and around the world. Tell me as you guys, your journey as a podcaster. Most of the times when we think about podcasters, we think about the NBA, think about football, EPL, La Liga. But you were a pioneer. You have been a pioneer when it comes to adding futsal to the podcasting landscape. Tell us what came of the idea how the idea came about, how it developed into actual reality, um, type of guests you have had, some of the best moments you have had as a podcaster to date, and your present numbers. Yeah, you know, I, I always like to do things maybe as the first person. And three years ago, we kind of researched how many podcasts in the world was there for futsal. And there wasn't too many of them. And I thought, you know what, because I've traveled the world, because I haven't some friends in FIFA and, and UEFA and, and obviously in CONCACAF and all the other confederations. I'm also a FIFA instructor and a CONCACAF instructor. I thought, wow, what a great story we could, if we could bring everybody on. Uh, so we started it and I, I kind of joked that my first four listeners were actually my children. Um, but I thought, oh, okay, we'll grow a little bit. But then Jeffrey, we went to 500 to a thousand. I'm like, Wow, I got a thousand listeners. That's pretty cool. Then we went to 10, 20, 50, 100,000. And now we're well over close to 250,000 listeners. And it, it, it's really been a great journey to really talk to some of the icons of the futsal around the world. I mean, Javier Lozano from Spain, who's the president of LNFS, uh, he came on the show. Obviously, he's won two World Cup and two UEFA championships. Um, Diego Catozzi won the last world championship has been on the current coach of Tyus from Argentina has been on, uh, Vic Hermans, who was the first MVP of the first world cup and now runs all of futsal, uh, in the Philippines has been on. And then I decided let's bring some other people that kind of grew up with futsal, but are not involved in the game, like a Landon Donovan. 
you know, Landon Donick came on and he talked about how important it was to play small sided games. Mark Polisic, Christian Polisic's father came on. Uh, you came on. Uh, Connie Constant came on. So it's really been a wonderful story. But what happened is that when the pandemic came, everybody was doing podcasts. Everybody was doing videos from their house. So I decided, you know what, I just didn't want to be another one sitting in the pool. So I kind of pulled back from my podcast. I didn't do as many. And what I found out is kind of like Netflix. is like when you go into Netflix and there's seven seasons, everybody's got to go back to the first season to catch up. And we've had so many people have gone on to the first show all the way up to well over 120 shows. And it's been fascinating and I really love it. So with that being said, if I may pick your brain, what's next when it comes to this podcast? And the name of the podcast is The World of Futsal, isn't it? The World of Futsal, that's correct. And it was kind of trying to figure out what I was going to call this thing. And obviously, I wanted people from around the world. So that's where I thought about the world. Uh, obviously, the game the, the game is futsal, so we threw that in there. Um, and it's been, it's been great. I've met a lot of great people through the podcast. A lot of people have reached out to me with questions, how to build courts, how to build a league, how to build an academy, uh, coaching. Uh, it's really been great. And I think uh, the next thing that we'll probably have to do is do what you've done. You, you've brought your, your face to the rest of the world through this portal, which I think is really, really cool. So uh, with the podcast and the video coming together, that'll probably be our next step. And I definitely welcome your handsome face to join me and as regards to, you know, being a part of a futsal landscape. It would be lovely to have you with it. Yeah. So we talked to you about the family man, and I am very humble the fact that you spoke about the family man first. We spoke about you as the administrator and coach and, and, and also the, the podcaster. Is there anything else before we go to the break that you would like, from an introductory standpoint, for the world to know, Trinidad and Tobago to know, the Caribbean to know, who is Keith Toza? Yeah, well, during the pandemic, as I said, as I'm the, I'm the technical director of United States Youth Futsal, and we decided that we were going to put coaching education together. So about a year ago, we started thinking about how to put together a level one grassroots online course. Now, isn't life about you come up with ideas and you kind of throw them out there and you go, oh, yeah, we'll do a level one, no problem. But then when you started going down to put information here to there, that was a really, really difficult task. We did hundreds of hours of templates and filming and methodology and terminology and picking professionals' heads and, and people involved. So we released a level one about six months ago. We released a level two about four months ago. And right now, Jeffrey, we have over a thousand coaches from around the world that have taken the level one and level two. Uh, people who are interested, all they have to do is go to usyouthfutsal.com and you can see that the courses are right there. Uh, the courses, Jeffrey, take about an hour and 20 minutes to take the course and then there's a test and then you get your diploma certificate. Right now, I'm about 75% through with the level three. The level three will actually be a six hour course, two hours in the classroom, four hours of practical on a court uh, it, it, within one day. Then we'll work on the level four, which is a weekend. And these are licenses. And then the final license, the level five is an international course, which is a week long. So we're right in the middle of level three and can't wait to get it up. Definitely would like to pass that information on to our coaches here in Trinidad and Tobago. Noting that yesterday we had our graduation, online graduation uh, ceremony because we also, during the pandemic, sought to um, add value to one of our strategic pillars, which is also coaching education. And we take this opportunity for the break to be able to remember what occurred yesterday. So we will be right back. You're watching Futsal ACC Corner Talks with Mr. Keith Toza. I call him Mr. Futsal USA. We'll be right back.
So we definitely hope to see them on the court soon, Keith, because this, this was a pilot project and we were so happy to be able to have other Caribbean island participants join us virtually. We were thrilled and we want to say thank God for the opportunity. But we definitely would also um, seek to work with you and your organization to see how we could get other coaches educated in sport of futsal. The more the merrier. It's all about bettering oneself. So we are very much happy to that. As we rejoin this program, you're watching Futsal 86 Corner Talks. You want to know, who is this person alone? It's, it's Mr. Kitoza from the United States of America speaking to us to part three of Futsal in CONCACAF. Keith, I want us to delve into the Futsal landscape in the U.S. of A. Tell us, give us a history of Futsal in the U.S. and what's its present state? Uh, futsal had been booming prior to the pandemic. And I think a lot of it has to do, and, it, and obviously futsal's been here for 50 or 60 years, um, and everybody involved in the game has been trying to grow and grow. I think about eight to 10 years ago, when Messi and Ronaldo and Neymar and Ronaldinho and a lot of the top players around the world said, I am who I am because in my country I grew up playing street soccer or futsal. I think that was a huge stamp in the marketing campaign that futsal, not only a great sport on its own, but a great developer of special players. I think in the United States, that really helped that movement, the connection, the bridge between futsal and outdoor soccer. Um, before with indoor soccer, a lot of the players who played indoor soccer went on to start in major league soccer. For instance, Preki played 10 years in the major indoor soccer league. And I believe he's the only back-to-back -back two time MVP uh, of MLS. So it's really been kind of like this huge growth and everything. Uh, courts are being built. U.S. Soccer Foundation, which was funded by U.S. Soccer, uh, made a commitment to build outdoor fields in the inner cities and urban areas around the United States. What they found that it was hard to find land, expensive to buy it, and difficult to take care of it. And plus, to get 22 players on the field, sometimes was difficult. So they moved their business model. Instead of building outdoor fields, they build mini pitches, futsal courts. They just completed 100 courts in partnership with Target, which obviously is a big manufacturer uh, of retail stuff here in the United States. Uh, coaching education is coming in, uh, involved, as we already mentioned, the level one, level two. Uh, you have United States Youth Futsal that grows all the time. You have U.S. Youth Futsal. And then you also have the United Futsal run by Rob Andrews, who has some great tournaments in Orlando at Disney and also around the world. So the way I see it, Jeffrey, is we have the youth game is growing. The adult game is growing on both sides, both men and women, boys and girls. And I only see that the sport will only continue to grow in the next years to come. What is your projection, if it is able to be data-driven, what is your projection as regards the number of courts to be built in the U.S. within the next 12 to 24 months, as well as you said that you are part of the U.S. youth futsal structure? How many children and what are the age groups of these kids who interact with the futsal ball? Well, if I take it from your national team coach, Connie Constant, he wants 600,000 futsal courts built in our United States, uh, which that would be awesome. But if, if you think about the United States, almost every elementary, uh, junior high, high school, university, college, church, they all have gymnasiums. But not just one gymnasium. A lot of these schools have multiple. Some have four to six gyms. And what are they? They're basically futsal courts. So we have a tremendous amount uh, of futsal courts uh, around the country. Then we have underutilized tennis courts that people are turning into futsal courts. Right now, I have the great honor to be working with a good friend of mine that I've known for years, Tom Beyer. He wrote a book called Soccer Starts at Home. He lives in Japan. He works along with the Houston Dynamo in Major League Soccer. And Paul Holliser is their technical director for the Dynamo Academy program. They reached out to me because Tom focuses on the two-year-old to the seven-year-old of ball mastery, not kicking it, but rolling it, moving it, manipulating it. But Paul thought, 
well, how do we take this program in the schools? So the Houston Dynamo in Houston signed on with KIPP Charter Schools, which is a big charter school group in Houston, but they're also in Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, and Detroit. They said, we want to do futsal. Because what I say is that ball mastery, Tom Byers' methodology, teaches and creates painters. But futsal is the canvas. So now these kids in their gym class is going to be doing ball mastery and also playing futsal in gym instead of basketball and the other sports. I see programs like that going to keep emerging all over the country. Anson Dorrance, head coach of North Carolina, who's won more championships with the women program, over 20. He's going to try to do the same thing in North Carolina, take futsal into the school system. Because, Jeffrey, as you know, a young boy and a girl in Sao Paulo, in Florianopolis, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, in the cities in Brazil, they go to science, they go to math class, then they go to gym. And you know what they do in the gym? They play futsal. So, and they create some great players. So I, I don't not only see that happening here in the United States, but it's, you're beginning to see it in the Caribbean uh, and the Central America that, that these programs are now starting to come. Education, youth programming, and futsal courts. I'm very, I'm very happy that you mentioned that because our Let's Play Futsal Caravan that we continue to do before the pandemic, we were, we were, we were clocking, we were on the ball. That came about when Connie was in Trinidad in 2018, preparing the girls for Argentina. And he was like, Joffrey, I'm bored, man. Let's go to the schools. And I was like, Connie, we have things to do. He was like, no, I want to go to the schools. And I took him to my alma mater, shout out to Presentation College San Fernando, as well as St. Mary's College, Port of Spain. And the first time we went to the school, I said, Connie, are you going to teach you guys anything? He's like, no. I was like, Connie, are you going to teach you guys anything? He's like, nope. All we're going to do is just show them two basic rules. Time and space and how to control the ball. After that, king of the court. Connie had the entire school and presentation college San Fernando eating out the palm of his hands. And from then, when he left, Let's Play Futsal Caravan began. And we continue to have it throughout the schools. And it's a great testimony as regards to, you know, the continuation of the of the of the sport of futsal in both islands of Trinidad and Tobago. And we are very much proud to be able to have somebody as Connie come back to Trinidad and Tobago again to be able to showcase what he knows to help develop the, the, the sport. So I'm definitely with you as regards to that. We need to get futsal into the schools throughout the islands and make it prominent. I yeah. truly yeah. agree with you on that. Yeah, well, Connie's kind of like a Pied Piper, isn't he? Right? I mean, he's, he's passionate. He 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 loves to get people involved, and he'll stay there until the last person leaves. And and his passion is one reason why he's been such a great coach, and, and wish him nothing but the best at the upcoming Concacaf. And the beauty about futsal is you're you're spot on. Defend that goal, go score in that goal, and just go play. And and it's kind of like a painter. Just go paint and play. And through osmosis, just playing the game. I, I, there's one thing we, uh, one of my ex players who is actually the goalkeeper coach, assistant coach for the national team now, Otto Orr, he built a futsal court in the inner city in Akron, Ohio. And we went there and just watched young kids play who never touched the soccer ball. And within hours, we said, oh my God, these, these children are going to be such great players because think about using the sole of your foot. When the ball starts going out of bounds and a young player runs after it and they have to stop it before they uh, it goes out of bounds, what part of the foot do they use? The soul. So all of a sudden you're teaching soul. And then as they touch with the soul, their momentum carries them over the ball, and now they're turning and facing their opponent. So the game is a great teacher, and I'm glad Connie did that, and congratulations for you for doing that. Well, I cannot, I cannot miss out Otto. You mentioned Otto. Otto Off was here with Connie as well in 2018 a close friend of the families as well. And he is such a great gentleman. And he really assisted as well our goalkeeper and our girls um, to be better players. And out of that program, we had a lot of girls who got scholarships um, to U.S. schools, as well as went on to represent Trent Tobago in the U20 football landscape and excelled. So it really showed a testimony 
of the sacrifices of both Otto and Connie when they came to Trinidad and Tobago for that two month period. So I'm very much blessed to be able to have them. So coming back straight to you, um, Keith, give us some, what has been happening with the PFL, the Professional Futsal League, since we last spoke? Well, we're still looking for a few more ownerships. Um, we have pretty much the infrastructure completely done. All the bylaws are written up, contracts are written up. We do have a group of owners. Um, we obviously had five events, uh, several in Florida, several in Dallas, and pretty much those were sold out. Um, I don't think we have an issue of finding players because a lot of players want to come to the United States. Um, a lot of coaches want to come to the United States and coach. I, I think futsal in the U.S. would be extremely important for the game globally, but really, really good for the CONCACAF region. Because think about it, a lot of the players from Trinidad or the other islands or Central America, they could come to the PFL and play and get that much needed experience at a high level and then go represent their country. So the pandemic didn't help, Jeffrey, and I'm hoping maybe within the next two or three years uh, we can kick off. As you guys see PFL, if I, could, if I can allow me to go deeper into this, yeah. would the PFL be for men only or would there be a female division as well? We would start with just men, uh, first off, but there's definitely needs a WPFL. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the United States women's national team would be a great futsal national team, you know, starting off right away. Uh, there's a lot of great women that are playing in, in CONCACAF and outdoor soccer, and I think could easily uh, relate to the game of futsal. So yes, uh, we definitely would love to have a women's professional futsal league. Uh, in North America. The MLS, many have said, um, started off well. Um, they are reincarnation of, of, of what was in the 70s where Pele came to the New York Cosmos. Um, even some Trinidad and Tobago um, natives such as Leroy Span um, um, and, and the likes who have made their names in these leagues. But the MLS, so many say that the MLS stuttered along the way before finding their great success based on the US model of sport. Is the PFL going to be following the MLS model? Has the PFL created their own model? Or is it going to be a hybrid of what is known to what you are good, or what is going to be innovative? Yeah. Now let's first talk about the, the MLS. Don Garber, who actually was in the same year at my college, uh, we graduated together, uh, the commissioner of Major League Soccer, they have done a wonderful job. In, in that league. Now, remember, uh, to be successful, sometimes you got to take a step backwards. Now, for the first 10 years, three men actually owned 10 teams. So you had Phil Anschutz owned six, and then uh, uh, the Kraft family owned a couple, and then the Hutt family owned a couple teams. So for 10 years, three men uh, owned those teams. Now you have well over 24 teams. Uh, Austin now just playing this year, uh, which is great. And they've done a great job. Now, they're six single entity business model. Uh, the PFL is not single entity. Sing, uh, the PFL will be individual owned franchises, um, which we feel is can be just as successful um, as MLS. But ours is really kind of modeled after the NBA business plan, uh, where MLS is more of the single entity. But they, they've done just fantastic. And I got to give a shout out. I was sitting around a pool one time. Years ago, 19, see, I got to go, 1989-90. And a coach came up to me, uh, a college coach, and he said, I got a player for you, and I was coaching a team called the Atlanta Attack uh, in professional indoor soccer. And I go, oh, great, what, what, what player do you have? And he goes, his name is Brian Haynes. And I said, oh, wow. And I was like, what, what position does he play? And obviously, Brian is from Trinidad. And uh, I drafted Brian, and I had the first pick because we were an expansion team. Well, Brian became an all-star, all pro. He told me about another Trinidad player, Garth Polonez, and I brought him in and he became an all-star player. Brian went on to star in major league soccer for Dallas. Um, and he's been an unbelievable uh, uh, guy and a player. So I have to give a big shout out for Brian and Garth. It's really amazing to be able to know that my fellow Trinbegonians have gone on to impress you and also the football 
an indoor football landscape in the United States of America. And we know that there are a lot who are doing that. Um, presently, we have the likes of, of, of another gentleman, I can't his name slipped me anymore at this moment, who is doing remarkably well to be able to promote um, indoor soccer. And we are happy to be able to know that that's the case. Coming back to the PFL, um, what would it take for a Trinbagonian youngster? So presently, you know, Connie has a, a team of 14. He have interacted with over 30 young men who are eager and willing to go. Um, given the fact that he have instilled in them some great technical and tactical awareness and the natural ability that these guys have, what would it take a Trinbagonian to be able to make a PFL team? Uh, well, let me first say that obviously, like, like Brian Haynes was a great player and Garth, there are tremendous players uh, in Trinidad and Tobago that I think just need to be seen. And I think that that futsal is really going to be that opportunity that they can be seen. And then you think about what is the graph going to be on how a young player from Trinidad or the United States who really hasn't played futsal come into a pro league? What is the graph for them to learn and get better? Is it, is it a slow graph? No. You know what the coaches around the world think? The coaches around the world say that if they came to the United States and had these teams, that the graph would almost be straight up, that these young kids who would be playing futsal every day with a high-level coach and around high-level players, that within a short period of time, we could start producing some great players. And – you know, when we talk about CONCACAF and, and we talk about the qualifier coming on, Guatemala and Costa Rica have won the last two or three championships because they started a pro league. So their, their players play futsal on their pro teams and practice three or four times a week, and they train with the national team two or three times a week. So they're playing futsal seven days a week at a high level. So I think with the PFL and players from Trinidad – coming to the United States and players from the other Caribbean islands also coming to the United States. I, I think it's just an unbelievable opportunity, not only for the league, but most importantly for the players themselves. I, I think it's going to be awesome. And definitely, we will definitely take advice from you as regards to what we can do as an association to help build our players before we export their, them to an organization such as the PFL and to any club that wants to be able to have their services, it would be an honor to be able to, to work with you to be able to speak more to that. Um, if it is we were to speak again to the, the organizational structure, the, the model that the PFL um, is going to showcase, again, being a little bit, you know, controversial here, when persons look at the MS, MLS to see success, but then when they look at the Women's Professional League, the last check was that in order for it to be, prof in order for it to be sustainable, um, there was a, there have to be a joint effort between the Mexicans, the, US, the Americans, and the Canadians. Do you see any chance of failure for the PFL? And what are the safeguards have the PFL from a business model standpoint? put in to ensure that there's continuity, noting that there may be um, some competition still from the existing indoor soccer arenas, from the major league soccer that has been doing well in terms of marketing and public relations, and other, other sporting entities and, sporting, and sports on the whole that America is known for, such as basketball and baseball. In order for a sports franchise to be successful, it, it's obviously you got to have players. Obviously you got to have a coaching staff. Obviously you got to have front office staff, but really the most important person is the person who's funding that team. For instance, Phil Anschutz who owned six MLS teams, he's a multi-billionaire. So he had the wherewithal to lose money as they built their dream. It's kind of very difficult starting any kind of company. I don't care if it's a restaurant, a bus company, uh, whatever, if you don't have the money to sustain losses while you're building your brand, while you're building your, your, your service or your product, you're, you're not, you're not going to make it. So the most important thing for the PFL is that we have quality owners like Major League Soccer has, like 
I think every owner in the NFL is a billionaire. And if not, he's just slightly below billionaire. Um, and, and that's how they become successful. Look at Elon Musk, right? So he's a multi-billionaire who started with cars. Well, what's he doing now? He's putting people up uh, in space and he's going to go to the moon because he has a vision here, but he has the money to make his vision a reality. To me, that's probably the most successful thing. Keith, we're going to take a break again. But before we do, I want to say best wishes to you as regards the PFL because you. your success is our success here in Trinidad and Tobago. And we really and truly want to be able to see a lot of Trinbagoians come across there and fly the flag high and represent the PFL. So definitely we want to see the success. So we're going to take a quick break. You're watching Futsal 866 Corner Talks. This is episode 48. We have with us Keith Toza. We'll be right back. My name is Adrian Welch and I am on Ala on the National Men's Football Team. Well, in the last game, um, I mean, the team, we were a bit, a bit slow, a bit lethargic. But, um, I mean, sometimes that, that happens on a day when, when, you, when you train a lot. And in terms of my personal performance, I, I would like to be involved a bit more. I would like to have a bit more chances, a bit more shots on goal. But, I mean, we're still growing as a team and we're still learning a lot about the game. Right now, the team morale is definitely high. I mean, there's a lot of love among the guys in the team. We get along pretty well, I would say. Um, we, we often call on each other after games to talk to each other about how the games went and how we performed and, and for advice and stuff like that. So, I would say it's pretty high. I think he's a good guy. His heart is definitely in the right place. And he is also a very knowledgeable, very well traveled coach. One thing I say, I can say that I have picked up from him is, is his pride. Although he's, although he's not a Trinidadian, he's, he seems to share that that love and that pride of this country more than most people that I've come across. And that's that's one thing that I would say that we, is, is something that we need a lot to in these qualifiers. We have studied a lot of teams actually. We've studied clubs in Brazil. We've studied the Brazilian national team. We've studied. Um, other countries in Congo, some of the uh, top nations such as Guatemala, Panama, Costa Rica, um, and other clubs around the world like Movistar, Barcelona, and so on. The transition at the start definitely was difficult. Although you, you'd like to think that the game of futsal is played with your feet, just like just like in football, but it, it's a, lo a lot of different movements involved, and that's something that you have to get accustomed to, which, which takes time. But I would say right now we're pretty. We're pretty, moving pretty well oiled, I should say, and um, looking forward to going into the qualifiers and representing the nation well. So that was Mr. Adrian Welch, who is an economist by day and a futsal player by evening. And what a, great, what a great lad. As a matter of fact, he was a former youth national football player who is making, like most of the guys on the team, the transition to futsal under the watchful eyes of head coach Constantine Constan, who is also a friend of Mr. Toza. Um, and as you heard, you know, um, Connie has been doing a lot of work with those guys and has been very extensive, to say the least. So, yeah. What do you think about that video, Keith? I, I love the video. That's I, I was going to say that without you asking me, but uh, it's great to see Connie. Connie's a great guy. By the way, I talk to Connie almost every day. I talk to him more than my kids. Um, uh, so it was great, but it, I know he's been doing a wonderful job. I know he loves it. Uh, I know he loves being a head coach of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and you got some great young players. I mean, anything can happen, right? So uh, in, in, a, in America during March, we have college basketball playoffs. We call it March Madness. Now comes May Madness with the CONCACAF qualifiers. So it's going to be an exciting time. Definitely. And I really look forward to it. And you you, you brought into a very good segue because now we're going to speak as regards to futsal and CONCACAF. What are your general and specific perspectives as regards to futsal in the Confederation? Yeah, you know, I talked about successful companies or sports franchises have a successful owner. I think the CONCACAF region is growing rapidly with futsal. 
I, I would love Hugo Saucedo used to be with CONCACAF and he was a futsal guy. And because he was a futsal guy, we did a lot more in the region. Since Hugo's left, we haven't done as much in the region. So I, I really would hope that CONCACAF looks at futsal as a great sport on its own to make money because obviously to make money drives people's visions. And we talked about that. Um, I also would like that all of CONCACAF realizes the importance of futsal to get young people off the street, to give them a different avenue. And I, I think being in sports is so wonderful for kids. And then I think looking at futsal in the CONCACAF region to create special players. I think when an investment into the game, like Spain did, like Brazil did, and other countries, I think can only be a windfall for CONCACAF. So hopefully in CONCACAF, it will continue to grow. You mentioned that name, Hugo Salcedo. I remember my first trip to Guatemala for the first ever futsal, uh, CONCACAF Futsal Club Championship. And a young sport administrator, first time in Latin America, Mr. Salcedo made me felt like feel like family. I had little to no Spanish, and he sat next song to me. And one of the things he always said was, "Young man, you need to learn some Spanish." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you 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 saw the passion. He brought us all together. He found us wherever we were. I I literally was just a name on uh on on, on Google and a Google search as regards to doing community based futsal events in Trinidad and Tobago. And he wrote to um, TTFA and he said, that, that gentleman needs to come to Guatemala. And the rest is history. And I, I wanna say thank you very much for persons like himself, to Carlos Queros, who has really and truly um, supported the journey when it comes to, and you see the nail on the head. It's very important that we as CONCACAF, the member associations, in spite of, you know, whether it be CFU, ONCAF, it doesn't matter. In terms of futsal, we need to come together to show the powers that be, the importance of the sport, and be united as one and grow. Um, I'm really impressed with what UEFA is doing. To your point where they even have a futsal app. What are your thoughts to that? By the way, I I have it. Me so, as well. Yeah. <laughs> I say that UEFA does an unbelievable job across the board in futsal. Great coaching education, great tournaments. I mean, they got a U19 Champions League, UEFA Championship. Uh, their European Championship is going to be fantastic uh, in 2022 in Amsterdam. The World Cup, obviously, you know, being in Lithuania, uh, they, they do a great job. Now, Ali, who is the head of futsal for AFC Asia, he kind of has done an awesome job with his futsal. And he's kind of partnered with the UEFA to do the coaching education and providing tournaments. Asia is really strong too. And, and I'm hoping to go back to your other question is that CONCACAF starts piggybacking on what UEFA's done, what Asia's done, and other confederations, because I think we can really be a big power. And maybe one day the World Cup, you know, winner comes from our region. That that would be awesome. Most definitely. And you speak about coaching education, which is something paramount to you. When you think about Keep Toza, you think about coaching education and what you have done to date. When we were doing our research as regards to coaching education for our coaches, we, we keep bouncing up on the same thing. You have to go to UEFA to be licensed. You have to go to UEFA to be licensed. How, how, how far are we in the CONCACAF to be able to have a CONCACAF license and what do you suggest for our coaches in the in, in CONCACAF, in the Caribbean, in Trinidad and Tobago, to be able to get licensed? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, by the way. We can talk for hours on that one. Uh, we have some great coaches in our region. I mean, you already said Carlos Carlos, a uh, personal friend of mine, coached against him many times uh, in, in CONCACAF qualifiers, Pan American games. We played against each other. Um so we got some great coaches. I, years ago, I, and I want to say, Jeffrey, five or six years ago, Connie, Otto, myself, uh, Ramon Raja was the coach of Mexico. Um, El Salvador coach came. We all went down to 
uh, Costa Rica to put together a CONCACAF uh, coaching education. Uh, Carlos became sick during that time, and and thing, and then Hugo left, and it, it kind of fell apart a little bit. But I think because uh, Laurent Morel, who was from UEFA, is a good, good friend, he does so much in the coaching education of UEFA. So when we were in Colombia in 2016, he says, Coach, I have something for you. It's kind of like a gift. And I said, well, what is it? And he gave me a, a little USB thing they put in your computer, right? And he goes, this is our uh, level B futsal course that we're going to throw out there. And when I put it into my computer and I went on, I was like, oh, my God. And I saw six languages at the bottom. So it is in Spanish. It is in English. It is in uh, uh, German. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, CONCACAF, if they can make a deal with the UEFA and just take their coaching education and use that, it'd be like turnkey. It'd be right away. And Vinicio, who was their head coach of Spain for many years, is now the futsal for their Spanish federation. He put it together, and he did an awesome job. And like I said, Ali from Asia has now done a lot of stuff that he learned from UEFA. And what, what, that's what I love about futsal is everybody shares. So maybe CONCACAF can call UEFA and say, by the way, can we use your program? Can Keith Toza bring arm CONCACAF to be able to get this done? You know, I, I, I would love to be more involved. You know, uh, Jeffrey, I, I coached in six CONCACAF championships over a course of 20 years. I got so much respect for CONCACAF in the region. Um, I would love to be a part of something within CONCACAF to, to help grow it at the youth level, the referee level, which is extremely important to the game, right? To have great futsal referees. Uh, to help coaches, to help managers, to help front office, and to help competition. So if they're listening, call me. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. Five to ten year outlook as you guys to foot selling CONCACAF. What would you want to see? Well, I, I would like to see coaching education become. I would like to see more competition between the countries and not just every four years. I would like to see a Champions League. I would like to see the club championship still going. I'd like to see a CONCACAF, like kind of like a European championship, you know, every two years. Uh, I think there needs to be more competition. I also think we need a U19 competition, both for men and for women. And that will inspire youth players, you know, who want to say, I start with futsal, I go to a certain age, I either go to football or I go to futsal because in futsal, there's, there's a championship, there's a club championship, there's a professional leagues. Um, I would really love to see that happen in our region. So this is the moment where it gets a little sticky here. And ah. this is where I need your coaching hat on. So we're going to put up a graphic. And I would oh. like you to be able to uh, <laughs> to do some predictions. Ah. Let's do this. <laughs> it's it's May Madness coming up. It's May Madness coming up. So yeah, you baby. have you're gonna get one million dollars. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Group A, Group A has Guatemala, Trinidad and Tobago, and the Dominican Republic. As you know. The top two teams move on without any biases. Please tell me who are your top two for group for each of the groups. As a matter of fact, I will list them out. I'll call them out, and reasons why you believe that those two teams will be moving on. So, Group A: Guatemala, Trinidad and Tobago, Dominican Republic. Yeah, well, you first got to go to Guatemala. I mean, they're the home host country. Um, they're going to be playing in Doma. And, and I don't know, obviously, there's not going to be many people there, but I played in that building with eight to 10,000 people, and you can't even hear your own self think. I, I think them being a CONCACAF winner, I think you got to look at them. Go to Trinidad, Tobago, our, my good friend Connie. Um, you know, it's when a couple of the countries fell out, um, I think that that kind of hurt them because I think they could have done well against some of the countries. 
Um, but I think Connie has done a great job in the last two months. And then Dominican, okay, they've been playing a lot of futsal. Um, I, I feel obviously with Guatemala coming through, um, I'm going to have to say it's going to be a tight race between the Dominican and Trinidad for that second spot. I think that first game is really going to tell who goes through. I'm going to go on the side of – actually, I talked to Chris Fernandez today. He took the Dominican. I'm going to take Trinidad Tobago. Wow, that's going to be interesting. So we have Chris pick, picking the DR and Keith picking TNT. So I'm definitely going to be creating a WhatsApp group amongst us so we can keep in contact when wow. we're watching this live. <laughs> oh we're, moving on to, we're moving on to Group B. Panama, Mexico, and Suriname. Yeah, I played against Panama many times. I mean, they love the counterattack. They've got great goalkeeping. they got a new coach. I think Panama is going to take that group B. Um, and then I'm going to have to go a new coach down in Mexico also. Um, Suriname, I don't think it's the ability to play as much as what Panama and Mexico does. So um, I'm going to have to go with Panama wins that group and Mexico uh, becomes the second place team. Lovely. Moving on to group C. We have Costa Rica, Canada and Haiti. Um, noting that, as Chris Fernandez said last week, that Haiti has a Canadian coach as well. Who do you have as his top two coming out from Group C? Yeah, and thanks, staying with Haiti, actually, the team trains in Canada. So uh, the Haitian team is, and I think it's either Toronto or Montreal, I want to say maybe Toronto, has a huge Haitian population. So that's going to be interesting when Canada plays Haiti because they play against each other a lot on their, on their club futsal teams up in Canada. Got to go with Costa Rica. I mean, obviously, they've won championship before. Carlos Carlos has been there so many times, and he's a wonderful coach. Um, but I'm going to have to go with Costa Rica, one, and Canada, two. Group D, we have Cuba, USA, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. Who this, do you is, have? this is, you know, in, in sports in our country, you call it the, the group of death. I, th this is going to be a really interesting group. You know, Cuba has been to the final on multiple occasions. We beat them first time in 1996 in, in Guatemala. Uh, we beat them again uh, in Costa Rica. They've always had a great team. They, they've always got good players. Uh, and maybe this is the year for them um, to get back to the final. But we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, the USA, obviously, uh, you have Dusan uh, and, and Otto running that program. I think they're going to be very good. But you got El Salvador and Nicaragua. Now, El Salvador, since the last world championship, has really been playing a lot of futsal as in, along with Nicaragua. I, I think those are two very improved teams. I have to pick that USA is going to win that group and Cuba is going to end up in second. And for viewers' sake, just to let you all know that the top teams of each group, as you see in there, Guatemala, Panama, Costa Rica, and Cuba – uh, the highest ranked teams in CONCACAF, with the second seeded um, being those in line in that of Trinidad, Tobago, Mexico, Canada, and US of A. So just to get that in highlight, I wanted to make sure I mention that because Keith is saying that USA, who is ranked lower than Cuba, would be defeating them to win that group of death. So thank you very much, Keith, as regards to that. It has been it's really and truly... <laughs> <laughs> of course, I definitely, I definitely get that. I definitely respect and understand that. But yeah. your your perspectives and um, sharing that that detail, reason why, um, is is lovely. I, I really appreciate that. We we're going to do that every single session for this uh, futsal and Concacaf series. Go ahead, sir. Now in March Madness, yes, in college basketball, it is always happens that an 11 seed beats a first seed. Yes. Okay? I mean, there are upsets. And this year, North Carolina, 
It's the first time in 20 years got knocked out in the first game. And there were some other big defeats. So is there a country here that might rise to the occasion? Now, in, in March Madness, they're all playing basketball. They're all playing the same sport all year long. So a young uh, a man or woman, because they, they also have the women's uh, March Madness, is that some of them just rise to the occasion and just have – the game of their lives and teams come together. They have the team in their lives. Now, a lot of these countries don't play full-time futsal. Some play outdoor, some play part-time, some play full-time. But is there a dark horse here? Is there somebody that might come through? Maybe that we didn't give them enough. I, I, I think there's always that opportunity. It's interesting that you mentioned that because one of the countries that, that, that left – um, due to circumstances beyond their control, was Curaçao. And Curaçao has been really improving along the lines. Um, the first time I heard about Dominican Republic was from Futsal Focus, Stephen, yeah. who mentioned their, their progress because he did a, a, an article on them. So I think that Dominican Republic, as you rightfully said, can be that dark horse. But let's step back a little, a little bit. There has been a lot of issues as well, COVID-19 related issues, where play, we, the teams were just about to peak and then COVID hit and literally everyone is scampered to the point where to, to some extent it might, it might be seen that some teams outside of Guatemala and Costa Rica um, would have been recovering. In our interview with Carlos Carlos. In December, he was saying that his some of his players were overweight and they had to get back into training. So it's going to be really interesting to see how yeah. how teams, how organizations have adjusted to COVID nineteen and everything that they've brought with it. Um, I can say from a Trinidad and Tobago standpoint that COVID nineteen actually worked in our favor, and I think that uh, Connie, Coach Connie, would have mentioned that to you. It kind of worked in our favor because we got some of the um better football players with really great football and iq and hunger to want to be able to learn and understand the game under the guidance of coach connie to and, and to put together a team and i i believe if it was last year we would not have this kind of quality um keith it is amazing to say the least and um i really want to see how they showcase as you said before it's going to be May madness and I'm, I'm going to be hashtagging that in, t in terms of futsal. Futsal me madness. Let's, I love let's, it. Let's, see, I love let's, it. I let's love do it. that. Let's do that, Skip. Let's, let's do that. Hashtag futsal me madness. I, I'm going I, with I, you on that one. I, I love it. And you know what? Your comment is so astute because, yes, the pandemic has changed the equation uh, somewhat because if you think about the United States, you got a player who lives in LA. You got a player who lives in New York. You got a player who lives in Miami. You got a player who lives in Chicago. You got a player here and here. It costs a hundred thousand dollars to have a camp to bring everybody together. If you look at and and now because you can't travel, I don't. How much have they gotten together? But but look at Costa Rica and Guatemala. They started a pro league, and ninety nine point nine percent of the players for Guatemala live within Guatemala City. 99% of the players for Costa Rica live in San Jose. So for their coaching staff and for their teams to get together, it's quite easy. Connie comes down to your country a month ago, and he has the players three, four, five times a week. He's got them on Zoom. He's got them training. Your, your comment was – that was a great comment. It's going to be interesting what COVID did. I got a question, though, or maybe a comment. And I, and I talked to Connie about this. What happens – well, let me go back a little bit. The NBA and the NFL and Major League Baseball and the National Hockey League, they have an injury reserve list. So when a player gets hurt, they put them on an injury reserve. You have to stay on that for a certain amount of time before you come back. They created a COVID list. So you could put a player on a COVID list yeah. and kind of like an injury reserve and bring another player up right away. What happens – two days prior to leaving for, for the CONCACAF that some players come down with COVID. Are you able to then bring up two players right away? You know, that's a very good question. I, I don't, I, I never thought of that to answer. Um, definitely. 
I don't think so. And I, I just, I pray that 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 doesn't happen for anybody yeah. individually yeah. and for a country. But can you imagine like three days prior to the competition, your top two players, your goalkeeper comes down with COVID and his roommate also cannot play. It, it could be very interesting what happens in uh, hashtag May Futsal Madness. Madness. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you mentioned the Dome. I was there at the Dome at the first CONCACAF Futsal Championship, and you were spot on in your description. It is amazing to say the least. But Guatemala is going to lose their home advantage, given the fact that there may be, there'll be little or no spectators at the Dome to give that deafening and electrifying, uh, as I will, we will say, six-man experience. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Um, it's it's, it's going to, I would love to see, psychologically speaking, how is that going to affect Guatemala? It, it's really and truly going to be interesting. This, I think for me, COVID-19 has been the great equalizer in many aspects of life. And let's see how it happens when it comes to to futsal and the CONCACAF futsal championship. Yeah. Um, but with that being said, we have to give kudos to CONCACAF to actually keep in the championship. 100%. Awesome job. Was because, and also for us here in Trinidad and Tobago, for our normalization committee to say yes, to say, guys, we're going to back you all 100% in preparation for the team, for the, for the championship. We're going to bring Connie in um, recommendations from the Football Association of Trinidad and Tobago. And it was great to be able to know that, you know, we got the opportunity to showcase um, a growing sport here in Trinidad and Tobago um, through these 14 selected men on the court in Guatemala. So it's, it's really a truly an honor. Yeah, I, I think CONCACAF doing it the way they did it, I think is fantastic. I think disqualifying is extremely important for our region. Um, you're, you're spot on when you said that the Doma, I, 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 I'm either cursed or blessed with a deep, loud voice, depending on who you talk to. If you talk to my children, they don't like it at all. <laughs> I, 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 could, I could not communicate to a player on the court 10 feet away from me. Uh, I remember playing Costa Rica in that building uh, and, and Guatemala, where two miles away, you're driving to the street, the Domo, and both sides of the street are lined with fans and on top of buses and playing music. I just got the chills. I just got the chills thinking about it. And then when you get into that building, it's such an amazing thing. Will it take the home field advantage away from Guatemala? I think in key parts of the game, when you need your crowd. Mm -hmm. You need your crowd at certain times, like maybe you're a goal down or you got the lead and you can continue it. However, Guatemala is playing on their own soil and there's nothing different than playing in your home country. I still think they got that advantage. But again, it's a great point, Jeffrey. Not having the people in the stands is, is going to create some interesting moments. Yeah, yeah. We have to create, we have to create that WhatsApp group and keep in contact. We definitely have to do it. Um, speaking to the members of CONCACAF, including us, Trinidad and Tobago, what suggestions would you give to us as regards to developing the sport of futsal? I, I would first say if you're not involved in it, get involved, believe in it. Um, I, I think it's a great developer of, 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 of players for outdoor at the same time, it's a fantastic game on its own. Um, I think to get young people involved in some kind of sport is extremely important. I think it can be a money maker for football associations. I think it's a great game for television. Um, I think it creates not only great players. I also think it creates great referees. When you see young people referee a futsal game, just like a player, they got to think quicker, they got to react quicker, and, and there's more situation that they got to think about that when they go referee in an outdoor game, they're going to be a better referee. It's it's just, I think it's great for a region, and, and I'm hoping one day before I go is that 
we get a CONCACAF country to win a championship. Let's work on it. Let's work on it, Keith. Before That's your right. closing remarks, can you tell me, can you tell us those three jerseys behind you? Can you give us the stories behind those three T-shirts? Uh, well, the one in the middle, the, the newspaper article was on, on the front page of the paper, not the front page of the sports section. So this is when we won our first championship. And remember I said we, uh, in 1998. Um, then on either one of these, uh, this is from an all-star game. I was fortunate enough to coach nine all-star games. Uh, and of course, Brian was on a couple of those. Uh, and this jersey was given to me when we, we, won our 700th game uh, in indoor soccer. So those are important to me. I said thank you very much for sharing those stories. And thank as you. a young sporting org uh, administrator, I recognize your constant use of the word we, because that is a lesson to me on this Sunday afternoon to be able to always remember and recognize that is not I, but it's we that makes success and legacy to be able to have plaques behind us and to be able to build to be able to build such a, a great history that you have done over the three decades of your involvement as a futsal coach, well a player, coach, administrator, and podcaster. So Mr. Toza, I want to say thank you very much and leave some closing remarks to you, sir. I, first of all, I, I'm so happy for your, for your success uh, with this podcast and, and show. I think you've done an unbelievable job with this. So uh, great to it. I, I want to really wish Connie, his coaching staff, the athletic trainer, the doctors, and all the players of Trinidad uh, and Tobago all the best in the CONCACAF. It will be a moment that these young men will remember for the rest of of their lives. They're, they are gonna be tied together and they're gonna be able to tell their children and their grandchildren that on this day, dad did this. And that's remarkable. And, and I pray, and I know it's gonna happen soon, is that there's gonna be a woman's CONCACAF qualifier and a FIFA World Cup soon to come. God bless you and everyone. Thank you very much. And God which bless you as well and, and ask that God protect you and your family during this time because one of the things that's very important during this COVID-19, even to our players and technical staff, is that word called resilience and that they can be able to tell their grandchildren that they lived through and played successfully representing their country during the COVID-19 pandemic, which speaks to resilience. Connie being in Trinidad and Tobago away from his family speaks to resilience. You being able to speak to us using technology speaks to resilience. I want to say thank you very much, Keith, for being here with us and sharing another moment. Let's not have a year come between us anymore. Let's no. be able to speak a little more, a little more often. <laughs> Definitely. It is my honor to come in the show. Now, what, what? To leave the show. What is our hashtag? Hashtag is hashtag futsal may madness. Love it. So you get right in. You copyright it. I'll wait until you put out the first hashtag, and then I will, I will, I will follow through with it with you. It's your idea. You, you didn't ask me who was going to be in the semifinal and the final. Oh, sh come on, let's hear it. Let's hear it. Uh, <laughs> or, or maybe we should have all come on one more time. But I got you know. Hold on, hold on. Before you do that, I think that's a good idea. Okay, let's do that. Get Chris that on. is a brilliant idea. So we'll choose a Sunday. And we'll make predictions, even if it's just for 15 minutes. Let's do that. I think that's a brilliant idea. So we'll get Chris on. We'll get the guys, other countries who are involved. Let's do that. I love it. I know, I know your podcast, this show, it doesn't matter. Let's do that. Let's do that. Hashtag Futsal, Futsal Me Madness. madness. Yes, it. sir. Have a good one. Have a great one. Talk to you soon. So that was Mr. Keith Tozer. It has been a great pleasure speaking to him. Episode 48, excitement. I mean, guys, I'm, I'm I was really tired. I must say I was really tired. But speaking to Keith, I am, I am rejuvenated, to say the least. Before we go, we want to recognize our 
Futsal 868 virtual race challenge and we ask each one of you all to go on raceroster.com and register. The first challenge is a 10 kilometers. You could ride, you could swim, you could you could run, you could walk, any which anyone you want to do. Register, be a part of it. And it's for a great cause. Stopping domestic violence against women. We have with us our Olympian, Cleopatra Borrell, who joined with us on this course. Take a look. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to announce that the Cleopatra Borrell Foundation will be partnering with Futsal 868 on their virtual race challenge to stop violence against women. As I said, the race is virtual but the sweat is real. Go on to www.raceroster, that's R-A-C-E-R-O-S-T-E-R.com. Search Futsal 868. As always, you know where to find it, and it's all the details are there. We have groups of five discounts and so like. So we ask you all to go register. Your run ends on June the 4th. We use the word run, but as I said before, there are other modes of transport, including walking, hiking, swimming. So be a part of it, take part of it, accept the Futsal 86 Challenge. So as always, I want to say thank you very much for joining us on another episode of Futsal 86 Corner Talks. Do have a blessed and wonderful week ahead. Bye. See you next week at Sunday.